I grew up on a beef farm in Missouri, and like everybody else that uh, raises livestock, we raise a lot of our own feed to stay in business, and we raise corn and soybeans and hay, and uh, we grind this stuff up into a flour, and we'd add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals, you make pellets, and you feed those calves for about six, nine months, and then you ship them off to be butchered or maybe to other feeders. And you always save back the very best ones for yourself, and you knock them in the head and eat them. It's a real simple cycle on the farm. And the thing that fascinated me as a teenager was that we went to a great deal of trouble for those calves, and yet, as a family, we ate out of the very same fields. We'd keep back five rows of corn for ourselves. We had a garden at the end of the field where we grew our peas and beans and squash and tomatoes. And we wanted to live to be 100 with no aches and pains, and we didn't give ourselves the very same vitamins and minerals and trace minerals that we gave the calves. And I always used to ask my dad, I'd say, hey, Pops, how come we go to all that trouble for those calves and, and not for ourselves? And uh, he'd say, shut up, boy. You're getting farm fresh food, fresh air, lots of free exercise. Don't ask complicated questions. And I was glad to get rid of the farm exercise and go to ag school at the University of Missouri. And there my major was in animal husbandry and nutrition. My minor was in field crops and soils. And I began to learn technical things about soil chemistry and how it related to tons and bushels per acre and ag economics. But I didn't get an answer to my basic question until I became a freshman veterinary student at the University of Missouri. And there I learned that the reason why we put all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds, bottom line, is because we don't have insurance for them. We don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, major medical hospitalization, Medicare, Medicaid. And if we were to use a human health care type of system for animals, it'd be sticker shock for you. And your hamburger would cost you $275 a pound. Boneless, skinless chicken breast would be 450 bucks a pound. A dozen eggs would be $50 just to pay for the health care. So we learned that we could keep the price of animal products such as meat and dairy and poultry and eggs down to where the average American could afford them simply by significantly reducing or totally eliminating health care costs. And we do that in animals by preventing and curing diseases with nutrition. Well, after graduating vet school, I went to Africa for a couple of years and got to work with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom days. And that was kind of a kick. Got to play Frank Buck, use a tranquilizer gun, tromp all over Central and South Africa for a couple of years. And then uh, Marlon sent me a telegram and invited me back to the States. Uh, he'd gotten a $7.5 million grant to, from the National Institutes of Health. And this was more than 30 years ago. And this was to study pollution and ecology and the environment. And my job as the wildlife veterinarian on the project was to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the big zoos around the United States. And I was supposed to identify or find a species of animals that was ultra sensitive to pollution. And we're going to use that animal much like the old uh, coal miners used to use canaries. You know how that goes. They take the canary down in the mine, and if methane gas or carbon monoxide were to leak into the mine, the canaries were more sensitive than the men and uh, would drop off the Persian dye and long before the men were in danger of suffocating or blowing up. Well, to make a long story short, after some 12 plus years of working on this project, I had done some 17,500 autopsies and over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings for a comparison. And what I learned was that every animal and human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. And I got kind of excited about nutrition again. And I wrote 75 scientific papers on the subject, uh, wrote uh, chapters for eight multi-author textbooks, actually contributed uh, a textbook myself, 1,000 pages, 2,000 illustrations. And uh, through the news releases that were in the big universities I worked with, I was on 2020. It was in 1,700 newspapers around the world through the UPI and AP Newswire services. And with all this public exposure and with all this scientific exposure, I couldn't get people who are in a position of authority, either in medical research or in politics, to get too concerned or interested in preventing and curing diseases in human beings with nutrition, just like we did in animals. Well, I got frustrated enough. I went back to school in Portland, Oregon, became a physician, and I practiced there for 12 years as a general family practitioner. And uh, I sewed up chainsaw wounds, delivered babies, um, used everything that I'd learned in veterinary nutrition of my human patients. And it was no surprise to me that it worked just as well in people as it did in animals. Well, uh, to get started, I always like to talk about longevity. And the human being has the genetic potential to live healthily, to be 120. And I'm going to prove that to you in just a minute. Unfortunately, Americans do a lousy job when it comes to longevity. Our average lifespan in the United States is 75.5, about half what we're genetically capable of. In 1990, when the World Health Organization examined the top 32 industrialized nations on Earth, the United States came out 17th. There was actually 16 other countries whose people's 
live longer than we do. We rank 19th in healthfulness. That meant that there were 18 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do before they develop heart disease and cancer and diabetes and arthritis and osteoporosis. We ranked 23rd when it came to live births and first year survivabilities of babies. And we ranked dead last, 32 out of 32, when it came to preventing birth defects. Now what all this means is we have the highest priced healthcare system in the world, but not the best. It also means that we have the most envied healthcare system in the world, but not the best. We have the most technologically advanced healthcare system in the world, but not the best. Well, I had a good friend by the name of Christopher Bird uh, for many, many years, over 20 years, and Chris uh, was a best-selling author on books on organically grown food. He was an expert in this subject, and uh, I was always trying to give him vitamins and minerals, and he refused to take them, and he'd tell me, Doc, I bring my own cooler. I don't eat any uh, hotel food. I bring my own organically grown food, and so I don't need to take vitamins and minerals. Well, I was changing planes uh, again in Atlanta, had an hour to kill, picked up the local newspaper, and guess whose obituary I found in the newspaper? Chris Bird. Of course, again, he was a best-selling author of books, uh, The Secret Life of Plants, The Secrets of the Soil, and he died at age 68 from a ruptured aneurysm, a type of stroke, seven and a half years before the average American dies. And he led a pristine life, lived up in the mountains, had an organically grown garden, collected herbs, you know, like Yule Gibbons and ate wild hickory nuts and all those kind of things. And because of his belief, he died of a copper deficiency. And I'll show you in a minute that copper deficiency causes ruptured aneurysms. And it's just a tragic thing that, that people have so much to give and die at less than half their genetic potential for longevity. A lot of people say to me, Doc, I don't need to take vitamins and minerals and trace minerals because I use herbs. Now, herbs are not nutrition. You have to understand that herbs are not nutrition. They are great plant medicines. Uh, they're safer. They're more economical, and most cases are more effective than prescription medications that doctors will give you, but they're plant medicines. If you have diarrhea, they can tighten you up. If you have constipation, they can loosen you up. If you have hypertension or high blood pressure, they can bring it down. If you have a fever, they can bring it down. But don't expect to get enough calcium or selenium or boron or copper or vitamin A from herbs. Well, I've been doing biomedical research and clinical research in animals and human beings, and I can tell you no matter how you look at health and longevity, whether it be in animals or human beings, there's only really two concepts you have to deal with. Concept number one I refer to as avoid stepping on the landmines. This is where you don't want to throw away your healthy physical body wastefully. You don't want to smoke. Don't abuse alcohol. Don't do drugs. Don't jog down the highway at 2 o'clock in the morning wearing an all-black ninja suit. You're going to get hit by a truck mirror, right? Whenever a doctor says, here's our options, never say, doc, whatever you say, you're the, you're the doctor. When a doctor says, here's our options, what you want to do is say, look, I want copies of all these records and tests, I want copies of the x-rays, and go visit three other doctors and three other hospitals. You want to talk to 12 of their living patients that had gone through this procedure, <laughs> talk to them, see if you really want to do this. I mean, you do this for your driveway and your roof and your fence and your yard and all that kind of stuff. Why not for your own physical body? That's concept number one. Now that you've avoided the landmines, you're in a good position to do all the positive things that you need to do to go on to live to be over 100. Basically, what you want to do is take all the essential nutrients, 60, that's 6 O minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. And they're called essential nutrients for two reasons. Number one, your body cannot manufacture them. You must consume these every day, either as food or as supplements. Number two, if any one of these essential nutrients is missing for a couple of months, a couple of years, you get on the average 10 deficiency diseases. You have everything to gain, nothing to lose by supplementing properly. Well, the medical profession, of course, has this malignant dumb belief that you can get everything you need from your four food groups. My favorite article of all time in the press was uh, April 6, 1992, Time Magazine, cover article, The Real Power of Vitamins, New Research Shows It May Help Fight Cancer, Heart Disease, and the Ravages of Aging. Six positive pages. If you haven't read it, I'd urge you to go to a public library, school library, dig it out and read it. There was only one negative sentence, and as you might guess, it was offered by a medical doctor who was actually uh, uh, contacted by the writer of the article, said, what do you think about vitamins and minerals and, and trace minerals as supplements for human nutrition? Here's what he said, quote, popping vitamins doesn't do you any good, sniffs Dr. Victor Herbert, a professor of medicine at New York City's Mount Sinai Medical School. We get all the vitamins we need in our diets, and taking supplements just gives you expensive urine, unquote. Now, Missouri translation of that is you're just peeing away your money. You might as well wad up your dollars, throw them in a toilet, and flush them away. You can get everything you need from your four food groups, is what he's trying to say. Well, I'd rather pee out 50 cents or a dollar a day worth of excess vitamins and minerals. That's cheap insurance. Think about it. How much money you spend for coffee or soft drinks or newspapers and that kind of stuff every day. 50 cents to a dollar a day to maintain and repair your body. And it's kind of fascinating that most people don't do it. Just remember, when you pay that doctor out of your own pocket, or indirectly through insurance, or indirectly through taxes, Medicare, Medicaid, not a single penny of that goes to better understand, manage, treat, prevent, or cure catastrophic diseases in kids, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men. Now, a lot of people ask me, why did you call your original tape Dead Doctors Don't Lie? 
Well, that's because I, I believe for a long time, because I'd done medical research for over 20 years in large medical research institutes, medical schools, the various laboratories, and I always had a belief in the medical system, but I, I was very disappointed when I learned that doctors don't know the most about health and longevity. Doctors don't know the most about disease. They do know about procedures, you know, how to fix your bones when you break them and that sort of thing, how to do a CAT scan. And so I began to look in the medical journals and sure enough, the first article ever published on health and longevity of American doctors was published in JAMA on June 15, 1895, a little over 100 years ago. They said at that time, doctors lived to be 54.6. I redid the study 97 years later using the same obituary techniques that uh, they did in JAMA. This was um, January 20th, 1993, in that particular issue of JAMA, and it turned out uh, the doctors uh, lived to be 57.6. I rounded up to 58 to give them the benefit of the doubt, and doctors just went berserk when I said that. I mean, this was the most outrageous thing that they ever heard. My principle is, my, my premise is, that doctors don't live as long as the average couch potato in America. And I purposely put that figure out there at 58 to try and challenge people. Well, doctors immediately looked at all the insurance actuarial charts. They got 250,000 dead doctors. They said, your group's too small. So they looked at 250,000 dead doctors, and they say, doctors don't live to be 58. They die at 62. And they still don't live to be 75.5 like the average couch potato. We actually uh, re-ran this again uh, using the entire obituary history for 1996. And for the entire 1996, of all the doctors dying in 1996, with all the medical treatments and drugs and, and procedures and everything and transplants, Doctors and in that study lived to be 70, still five and a half years short of the average couch potato in America. So they still have never proven that doctors live as long as everybody else, and that's why dead doctors don't lie. <laughs> now, if you do everything right, how old can you live to be? Is it worth all the effort? I believe it is. Here's one. Christian Mortensen from San Rafael, California, in August of 1995, turned 113. August of 1996, he turned 114. He's still going strong, certainly can live to be 115. Uh, smokes a couple of cigars a day, like George Burns, who also lived to be over 100. Uh, certainly was, I guess the only exercise George Burns ever did was put the cigars in his mouth. This gal here, Dora Ramathebe from South Africa in July of 1995, turned 114. And when she was asked by the media, Dora, what do you attribute your health and longevity to? She did not say that we owe it all to our annual physical, our, our HMO. She said, I ate locusts every day. You know, a little grasshopper. She's not a vegetarian. She eats little animals. Pumpkin seeds, tortoise meat, wild herbs, dried fruit, and starts each day with a cup of coffee. This gal here, Margaret Skeets from Radford, Virginia, in 1994, was the oldest documented living American when she died at age 115. Fell over and fractured her hip. Three weeks later, she was dead from complications of osteoporosis, a simple calcium deficiency. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. Unfortunately, this is not unusual. 75% of all Americans over the age of 65 who fracture a hip or major leg bone don't live 90 days. They die of pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, stroke, and other complications of that fracture. Susie Brunson, according to her family, in December of 1994, was the oldest American when she died at age 123. And they base their claim on her birth date, December 25th, 1870, which is recorded in the family Bible. And this fellow here, Francisco Barrison Wave of Chaparina, October 1995. He was from a little town outside of Bogota, Colombia, turned 125. When he was asked by the media, Francisco, what do you attribute your health and longevity to? He said, well, I drink a gallon of goat's milk every day. Also, it's kind of fascinating in his birthday announcement. This is not an obituary. This is a birthday announcement. He said that over 40 years ago, his physicians told him he only had a couple of months to live, so he had his sons build him a coffin. And uh, he's been waking up every morning for more than 40 years, sitting by that coffin, waiting to die. <laughs> Good night time comes, he goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, sits by the coffin, waits to die. Now, he's still going strong, and all the doctors who told him that more than 40 years ago are long since dead. Now, this fellow here, Hamoudi El Abdullah from Syria, died at age 133, and he was still fathering children after the age of 100. He um, remarried for the fourth time when he was age 80. Fathered four boys, five girls, nine children after the age of 80 with the same wife. And you add up the pregnancies and the breastfeeding, the time in between pregnancies, he was still fathering children after the age of 100. Now, this very next one is my very, very favorite. This gal, Mazumi Dusty from Iran, according to the Rocky Mountain News Wire Services out of Denver and the Iranian News Agency, this was January of 1995. She died at age 161. Now, you have to give a certain amount of credibility to this obituary report that she died at age 161 because she was survived by six living children ranging in age from 120 to 128. They hadn't even left home to go to college yet. <laughs> now, her oldest son, Golam, said his mother had never visited a doctor nor taken any chemical medications during her life, did take a few herbs. 
So if you kind of think about it, every one of these people who lived to be over 100, 120, 130, 160, these people are not from the United States or Canada or Germany or England. Kind of interesting, isn't it? They're, most of them are from third world countries. They're furthest away from medical help and they live to be old. So that we're beginning to collect information here. The last one we want to look at, the National Geographic Society, a very respected group of uh, people, scientists and, and so forth, and support groups for science. Uh, comes out with a monthly magazine, the National Geographic magazine, of course. And they, uh, in January of 1973, came out with a nifty special issue on longevity. They, they looked at cultures whose people live to be 120. And they documented the oldest living human being that they could find based on their criteria. This fellow, uh, by the name of Shirali Mizmalov from Azerbaijan, a little country just south of Russian Georgia in western Russia today, they documented him as being 167 years old. Remember, this is the National Geographic Society, not the National Enquirer. 167 years of age, and they had a half-page picture of him actually harvesting tea leaves in a tea plantation, still working eight hours a day, six days a week, when he's 167. Five months later, May of 1973, Shirali Mizmalov turns 168, goes out and hoes the garden for reporters to show how vigorous he is. Now, for at least 50, maybe 70 years, medical doctors in America have been poo-pooing the idea that you could live well beyond 100. You know, people who lived 115, 120, they were one in six billion. It wasn't something that everybody could look forward to. And anybody who tried to teach people how to live to be 110, 120, 140 were considered charlatans and quacks and taking advantage of uh, older people. I was glad to see this come out. Uh, this was a news article in the USA Today newspaper in October of 2000. And it was based on an article in the journal Science, a very respectable journal. And what they said was, forget 100, try living past 120. Humans possess a maximum life expectancy longer than 120 years, which has been the long theorized medical limit. In fact, lifespans appear to be increasing over time with no end in sight. Now, the cute part of this is, now that there's no doubt about it, everybody agrees that human beings, including Americans, have the genetic capacity to live well beyond 120. And doctors want to take credit for it. The things that have actually increased our longevity from 45 average lifespan in 1895 to 75.5 today, which is an increase of about 30 and a half years, are sewers and good clean water, public health things. We don't have cholera and leptospirosis and tuberculosis in our food supply and our water supply anymore. We have meat inspection, we have uh, public water works and things, we have sewers. These are the things that have extended our lifespan. Then there's this salt thing. You know, whether you believe it or not, this medical dogma has really caused a lot of problems in America. How many have ever heard that using a salt shaker is bad? You're going to get hypertension, right? You're going to get heart disease and stroke. What's the first thing that a good farmer puts out for his livestock? A salt block or a salt lick, isn't it? There's nobody out in the pasture telling a cow she's limited to one lick a day. <laughs> I refuse to believe that my human patients are dumber than a cow. Say, look, go ahead and pick up a salt shaker and you're going to see that lightning won't strike you. You can go ahead and salt your food to taste, you can salt your body, nothing bad is going to happen. And 98% of my patients love it. They bring me hundreds of new patients every month who want to use salt and not to feel guilty about it. And 2% of the bean counters, they say, now, Wallach, we love you and respect you. We have this high-priced cardiologist that says you're flying in the face of all the weight of medical evidence. You can't tell people that um, they can use a salt shaker because you're going to kill them with high blood pressure and heart disease and stroke. And I've been vindicated in this belief. Uh, this was actually a study that was published in the New York Times, May 22, 1996. And this study was abstracted from JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the most prestigious medical journal in the world, according to themselves. <laughs> now, in this particular journal, a Dr. Alexander Gordon Logan, who is an epidemiologist and cardiologist on the teaching staff of the medical school at the University of Toronto up in Canada, and he took 56 existing studies on hypertension or high blood pressure and restriction of salt, combined the data from these 56 studies, which included 3,505 people. He threw away all the conclusions and reevaluated the larger group. And what he found out was this. If you have normal blood pressure and you restrict salt, it will not prevent you from getting heart disease or high blood pressure. If you have hypertension or high blood pressure and you restrict salt, 97% of those with high blood pressure or hypertension who restrict salt will not get any measurable benefit. 97% will not get any measurable benefit. Zero. 2-5% to 5 get measurable benefit, but it's not significant. They're only able to reduce their blood pressure by 3.7 millimeters of mercury. So here's what Dr. Alexander Gordon Logan said in JAMA, May 22, 1996. He said, you might as well go ahead and salt your food to taste. It's a meaningless exercise. Don't get paranoid about salt. 
It has nothing to do with blood pressure problems. There has never been one single iota of proof that restricting salt has any benefit. It's just one of those medical myths, he called it, but I'm going to call it a medical caca. Now, if it's not salt, what causes high blood pressure? Well, it's not salt, first of all, because salt is an essential nutrient. It has a combination of sodium and chloride, both of which you need. And according to the American Heart Association, the minimum daily requirement for a 150-pound person for salt each day is a heaping teaspoon, six to nine grams of salt a day. Now, the Japanese who live longer than we do, the Japanese who live 4.1 years longer than we do and have half the cancer rate, they eat 12 grams of salt a day. They eat three times the salt we do. And they live four years longer, have half the cardiovascular disease rate, and half the cancer rate we do, and yet they eat three times as much salt as we do. So you're beginning to put the puzzle together that doctors really don't know what they're talking about. That's why dead doctors don't lie. Well, if it's not the salt, and if it's not genetic, what is it? Well, it's actually just a simple mineral deficiency. Raise your hand if you ever heard that cholesterol's bad. And you've got to get it low in your blood. You've got to have a low cholesterol diet. Otherwise, you're going to get heart disease, right? Doctors would like to blame all cardiovascular disease on cholesterol. We've known for 75 years in the animal industry that cholesterol is not a boogeyman. There's not a single disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol or triglycerides. If you can find me one, I'll give you a million dollars in small bills in any offshore account you want. There's not a single disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol or triglycerides. Elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides are really just a warning signal, much like a fever. Fevers don't cause infections, but when you have an infection with a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, maybe a parasite, you can get a fever. You can have a broken leg and get a fever. You can have cancer and get a fever. You can have liver disease and get a fever. Babies get a fever when they teeth. And so you have to kind of sort it out. When somebody comes into a doctor's office with a fever, you have to say, well, okay, here's my whole list called a differential diagnosis, all the things that cause fever. If they're 80 years old, you can quickly rule out teething, right? <laughs> but the rest of them, you may have to do some lab tests for them. At any rate, the same thing is true for elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides. When you have elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides, it might mean that you have hypothyroidism or low-functioning thyroid gland. You could have diabetes. You could have uh, deficiencies of niacin, chromium, vanadium, the essential fatty acids. You could have liver disease. All kinds of reasons why you might have elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides, but they themselves don't cause any problems. Now, the Eskimos above the Arctic Circle have a traditional diet that's 98% red meat and blubber. Uh, they eat whale b meat, whale blubber, uh, walrus meat, walrus blubber, seal meat, seal blubber, bear meat, bear fat. There's not a single Eskimo above the Arctic Circle that has a Mr. Juice Man juicer eats organically grown broccoli. <laughs> their uh, average uh, cholesterol ranges from 250 to 350, and yet they're legendary for not getting cardiovascular disease until they come down to the lower 48 and eat like us. Then when they get the cardiovascular disease, they go back home to die up above the Arctic Circle. They start eating whale blubber again, and it goes away. Well, learning all that, I felt very confident in telling my patients, look, we're going to do something different. My goal as a physician is to have my patients die at an average age of 100. I don't want my patients dying at 75.5. I want to give them another 25 years. I want the average lifespan for my patients to be 100. And uh, we're going to do something different. If you want to do everything that all the other doctors and patients are doing, I want you to go to them because I don't want you to lower my average, right? We're going to do something different. It's just real simple. My favorite disease is arthritis. I love arthritis. Now, the reason why I love arthritis is it's easy to fix. And when you can fix something as horrible and as debilitating, as painful and as expensive and as miserable as arthritis, you get kind of excited about this concept of preventing and curing diseases with nutrition. And uh, so I tell people about this arthritis thing all the time. So let's have a quick look at arthritis. Uh, number one, 75 to 80% of all Americans over the age of 50 get arthritis to one degree or of one type or another. And according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, 35 to 50 million baby boomers are going to get arthritis in the next 7 to 10 years, and there's not a single medical treatment designed to prevent or fix it. Aspirin certainly doesn't fix arthritis, causes gastric bleeding and death. Tylenol doesn't fix arthritis, causes 50,000 cases of kidney failure each year, 5,000 of which are so severe you need a kidney transplant. Then there's ibuprofen, Advil, and Aleve. These things don't fix arthritis, and they cause liver disease in 2 to 5% of the users, including liver cirrhosis, even if you don't drink. And then there's methotrexate and gold shots. These things don't fix arthritis. They subdue your bone marrow so you can't make normal platelets and white blood cells. And then you have the granddaddies of all the medical treatments for arthritis, prednisone and cortisone. They don't fix arthritis. They subdue your immune system, which leaves you open to diseases far, far more horrible than arthritis. And prednisone and cortisone accelerate the loss of minerals from your bones, something you don't want when you have osteoporosis and arthritis. 
Now, when these prescription medications and over-the-counter medications don't work anymore to relieve pain and inflammation, the only thing left for you medically is joint replacement surgery. And uh, I, I never like to send my patients in for the joint replacement surgery because they never work out well. In fact, many times you're worse off after the surgery than you were before the surgery. The advantage my patients have always had is that I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician. And so I always used to tell my patients, look, we have all these nutritional formulas designed to prevent and cure diseases in animals, including arthritis, and so I tried adapting nutritional arthritis formulas designed to prevent and cure arthritis in pigeons and turkeys, dogs, cats, sheep, pigs, horses, cows, lions, tigers, and bears to human use. And it was no surprise to me. It works just as well in humans as it does in animals because it was designed to prevent and cure arthritis in pigs. And I've literally seen tens of thousands of people who've had a regrowth of cartilage, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, bone foundation, bone matrix. doesn't matter if they're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. I've seen people 97 years old regrow cartilage and bone even if they had bone-to-bone -bone arthritis. If there's blood supply to that joint and that bone, they will regrow uh, bone and cartilage. Well, of course, Harvard Medical School goes berserk when you say stuff like that. Wallach, well, you can't say those things. The only thing left for people when they get bone-to-bone -bone arthritis is joint replacement surgery. And I'd, I'd agree with him if the only raw materials you're using is Tylenol and aspirin and prednisone and cortisone. We've learned over 50 years that you can't regrow cartilage and bone using those things. One of the basic things, of course, that the Harvard Medical School jumped onto, and they said, this is so ridiculous that this couldn't work. And so they took 29 patients, arthritis patients, who had failed to respond in any way to heroic medical treatment for arthritis, over 15 to 20 years. They took them off all their medication, wasn't working for them anyway, lined them up for joint replacement surgery, and they said, look, for 90 days before we do the surgery, they gave them a heaping tablespoonful of ground up chicken cartilage and their orange juice every morning for 90 days. They were sort of chuckling in their beer saying nothing's gonna happen. Well, here's what happened. In 10 days, these people, these 29 people, had complete relief of pain and inflammation, something they hadn't had in 15 to 20 years. In 30 days, they could now open up a new pickle jar that never been opened without pain to the fingers, wrists, elbows, and shoulders. In 90 days, 28 of the 29 were clinically cured. Now, this is from Harvard Medical School in the Boston VA. That meant that they had complete return to the range of motion. All the pain and inflammation was gone in their fingers and toes and hips and knees and their neck. And uh, certainly, many of them still had knots on their fingers because it was only 90 days. And you'd think they'd call me up, uh, these professors you know, of medicine from Harvard Medical School and from the Boston VA, and say, look, Wallach, we have to apologize to you. We've been bad-mouthing you for 20 years. And why don't you come up to Boston? Let's talk about the whole thing. Here's what they said. Quote, after three months, it was clear that the drug was beneficial. Unquote. Chicken cartilage had become a drug in 90 days. <laughs> now, why would that happen? Well, because you can't patent chicken cartilage. And uh, they convinced at the U.S. Patent Office that they were using a drug to do this study. And they actually got a use patent on chicken cartilage. And you, too, for 3500 bucks a month, can get Harvard Medical School's chicken cartilage in a capsule for arthritis. Of course, cartilage has chondroitin sulfate in it, glucosamine sulfate, collagen. These are all the basic raw materials to rebuild cartilage and bone. Raise your hand if you know what the red warning light is for on the dashboard of a car truck. Back before we had dials showing temperatures and things, they used to use the red warning light, right? It was called the idiot light. And when that red warning light came on, it meant that your engine was heating up. You didn't have enough coolant or oil, or maybe you broke a fan belt or split a radiator hose. And a reasonable person would, would pull the vehicle, car, or truck over the side of the road and deal with the problem so you didn't burn the engine up. Even, even a Mercedes would burn up if you didn't have enough coolant and oil and a fan belt and a radiator hose. Then, of course, the village idiot, that's why they call it the village idiot light or the idiot light, uh, they'd be driving along, they'd see that red warning light come on. they say, I don't have time to deal with this. So they whip out their pliers, they cut the wire of the red warning light, and they keep on driving. Now, even a Mercedes will burn up if it doesn't have oil, coolant, a fan belt, and a radiator hose, right? And so you really have to be the village idiot to do that. Nobody in their right mind would do that to their vehicle. How many of you know what pain is for? Raise your hand if you know what pain is for. That's pretty good. Most of you know that. Pain is the red warning light for your body. When you get pain in your foot, your ankle, your leg, your knee, your hip, your back, your shoulders, elbows, wrists, and fingers, your body's saying, don't use those joints, don't use those bones, don't use those muscles until you fix them. It's absolutely criminal, absolutely criminal for a doctor to write you a prescription for a pain reliever, an anti-inflammatory or muscle relaxant or any of those combinations without rebuilding the bones and the joints and the cartilage at the same time. If they just give you a pain reliever, just give you an anti-inflammatory and or a muscle relaxant without rebuilding the joints and the bones at the same time, all they're doing is cutting the wire of the red warning light. You're going to wear those bones and joints and cartilage out faster and faster and faster. It's actually a negative to be taking painkillers and anti-inflammatories without rebuilding the joints and the bones at the same time. The reason why I say no carbonated drinks, and I've been doing that since 1964, is because carbonated drinks actually will neutralize your stomach acid 
And you cannot efficiently absorb minerals, digest protein, or absorb vitamin B12 without stomach acid. You have to have stomach acid, like battery acid. Doctors have the criminal belief that you don't need stomach acid. And they give you all these drugs to get rid of your stomach acid, antacids, and they give you drugs to stop producing stomach acid, right? They don't want you to have stomach acid. Absolutely criminal. You can't digest food and absorb food without stomach acid. I know most of you knew that carbonated drinks neutralize stomach acid. If you remember back 25, 50, 75 years ago, when somebody would ask their doctor to say, look, I just ate, a, I overate, I overate a Thanksgiving dinner, and I have heartburn and indigestion, what do I do? And that was before they had Zantac. They say, well, take some 7-Up, drink some ginger ale, drink some club soda, take, take some uh, sparkling water, because the carbonation will neutralize your stomach acid and give you some relief, and it would. Now, if you do that three times a year, drink a carbonated drink three times a year for Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter because you overeat during those holidays, that's okay. You're going to survive. But when you're drinking two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten carbonated drinks a day, you're not going to survive because over the long haul, you will not be able to absorb the nutrients. You're going to get some horrible combination of terrible diseases. This came out in June of 2000. And this is a Harvard study on 460 junior high school girls in ninth and 10th grade and what they found out was that those junior high school girls who drank one non-cola carbonated drink every day, they increased their risk of fractures and osteoporosis as a teenager by 300%. They found out that if they drank one carbonated cola drink, a cola carbonated drink every day, they increased their risk of fractures and osteoporosis as a teenager by 500%. Now, do you think that this is more dangerous for teenagers or adults? It's much more dangerous for adults because you only have 25% bone matrix and you're very, very slow to recover where teenagers have 40% bone matrix, and they can recover in a week's time. We learned in 1957 from a turkey study uh, where they took 250,000 turkeys, and they put them on a complete turkey pellet, trying to get them to finish for market within a few days or a week or so of each other. And in the first 13 weeks, fully half of them, 125,000 of them died. Farmers were out there every morning. They picked them up every morning by the bushel basket full, took them to the state diagnostic lab to see what they died from. When they opened them up, every one of them had died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. And one of the clever pathologists says that's got to be due to a copper deficiency because copper is required to manufacture the elastic fibers of arteries and skin and other tissues. And the mechanism of an aneurysm is identical to the mechanism of a balloon on a weakened wall of a tire. You know when you hit a chuck hole with your tire and you break the cords, the internal pressure blows a balloon, you overload that tire with weight or heat it up on a highway, it blows out. Same way with an aneurysm. When you have a copper deficiency, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers uh, in that artery, the internal pressure, even normal blood pressure will blow a balloon in that artery, and a balloon in an artery is called an aneurysm. And of course, if it's in a strategic place like the brain, the carotid artery, the coronary arteries, the large arteries, the AR to pulmonary artery, renal arteries, they blow out, you die suddenly, uh, just like you've been shot. Well, uh, they got excited about this. They doubled the amount of uh, copper in these um, pellets. The next year, they tried to raise 500,000 turkeys, and they did not lose a single one from a ruptured aneurysm. They went from a 50% loss to a 0% loss just by adding a little bit of copper to those pellets. So they said, well, maybe the same thing is true for humans. And in 1958, they started looking at uh, copper deficiency in various species of animals and humans, and here's what they found out. The very first symptom of copper deficiency is white, gray, and silver hair. Copper is required as a cofactor to manufacture hair pigment. doesn't matter if it's blonde, red, brown, or black hair. And I see a lot of copper deficiency in this room. I can almost tell you which people, men and women, who have colored their hair get pretty good at that, at being a physician. And you don't want to be like a medical doctor and just treat the symptoms. If you're just coloring your hair, you're treating the symptoms. You need to do the basic thing of take some colloidal copper. And if you don't, uh, what's going to happen is... Uh, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in your skin and you start getting crow's feet around the corners of your eyes and your mouth. Parts of your anatomy begin to sag and you know you're in trouble when your doctor tells you, look, I've got a golf buddy down the hall who's a plastic surgeon for $10,000 he'll make you look 20 years younger. But you don't need a facelift, a booby lift, a tummy tuck or a derriere lift. All you need is some copper and everything will come back up just like you have a hydraulic jack under it. It'll just come right back up. Those elastic fibers tighten right up. People say, Francine, did you get a facelift? You look great. You look like you're 20 years younger. Now, if you don't take some action at that point, the next thing that happens is you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your legs and you get varicose veins. If you don't take action at that point, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your exhaust pipe and you get hemorrhoids. So if you have hemorrhoids, varicose veins, things that sag, wrinkles, white, gray, or silver hair, the odds are you have aneurysms developing in you somewhere. And you don't want to, of course, die suddenly of a ruptured aneurysm when your body's been warning you for 10, 20, 30 years. Just remember, people don't die suddenly of an aneurysm. It may be you drop and die. Think about old Albert Einstein. 
He died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm at 68 years of age. What color was his hair? He was famous for wild white hair, wasn't he? Now, you'd like to think that people who win the Nobel Prize in medicine would at least live to be 75.5, but they live to be 58 just like other doctors. And, of course, that's because they are trained and they believe and they practice. You can get everything you need from your four food groups. doesn't matter if they win the Nobel Prize or not. This guy here, Dr. George Kohler, was the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Prize in medicine in history. 37 years old, wins the Nobel Prize in medicine, and he won the Nobel Prize in medicine for studying monoclonal antibodies, which are antibodies trained to attack cancer cells. And if they ever get this really working, it'll be great because they won't have to use chemotherapy anymore, which kills more people than it saves. 11 years after winning the Nobel Prize in medicine, Dr. George Kohler, now 48, drops dead of a cardiomyopathy heart attack because he believed you can get everything you need from your four food groups. Didn't take any selenium, died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. Now, I have to tell you why athletes are an early warning system. Couch potatoes, by definition, are people who go to extraordinary efforts not to sweat, right? They make every human effort not to sweat. They're changing the TV channels. Honey, bring in the popcorn. I'm changing the channels. Son, bring me the TV guide. I'm changing the channels. By contrast, athletes have the attitude, no pain, no gain. And they're out there sweating and working away, power training, strength training, running, and they sweat. Athletes, no matter age, they sweat more in five years than couch potatoes do in 70 years. And when you sweat, you don't just sweat out potassium and Gatorade. You sweat out all 60 essential minerals. If you sweat out all of your selenium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of getting a cardiomyopathy heart attack. You sweat out all of your copper and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of developing an aneurysm and dying suddenly of a ruptured aneurysm. You sweat out all of your chromium and vanadium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of getting diabetes. And if you sweat out all of your calcium and magnesium and boron and zinc and sulfur and other minerals that are required for cartilage, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, bone, you're going to get a joint and bone injury. What is the biggest single cause of an athlete's career being ended early. Joint and bone problems, right? And that's because they sweat out all the basic minerals that they need to maintain those parts of their body and they don't supplement with them because doctors tell them that they can get everything they need by eating their four food groups. Well, what are the early warning systems for mineral deficiencies? We already told you about white, gray, or silver hair for a copper deficiency. Liver spots or age spots on the back of your hand, side of your face or neck, these things are caused by a selenium deficiency. And you know, again, about selenium deficiency. Then, of course, uh, you have toe cramps, leg cramps. So you can have hypertension. These things are all caused by a deficiency of calcium. And if you're an athlete at age 25 or 15 and you get a leg cramp, there's a calcium deficiency, your body's telling you if you don't stop drinking those Pepsis and start supplementing with some calcium, by the time you're 40, 50, 60 years old, you're going to have arthritis and osteoporosis. But most people say, well, I've got to get this high-priced trainer. I need somebody who can give me massage therapy because I have a cramp. And they don't go and take their supplements.